All right, and we're live. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Education on ER series, a free set of Google Plus Hangouts to learn from educators, leaders, and technology professionals around the world. My name is Jordan Pedraza from the Global Community Team for Enterprise Education. In today's Hangout, we'll hear how the University of Michigan recently migrated from over 40 different email and calendaring systems to Google Apps for Education. Together, Michigan and Aperio carefully planned and executed a six-month phased rollout that ensured a smooth transition to a common Google Apps collaboration platform for over 80,000 students, faculty, and staff. Today, we'll learn more about their migration planning and execution process, along with many other migration topics. If you have any questions or comments throughout the Hangout, please post them in the comment stream and use the hashtag AppsEDU. So with that, I'll hand it on over. Thanks, Jordan, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ryan Viss, and I'm the service owner for Collaboration Services here at the University of Michigan. Uh, with me today is Martin Sager, who is our technical manager for collab Collaboration Services, and uh, David Spangler, who was our solutions architect from Aperio. And also joining us today is Sarah Campbell. And I apologize, I don't have your title. Sarah set this up for us. So she's the <laughs> guru who got us wrangled into doing these presentations. Um, we're going to switch over quickly here. Where's my mail? Because who knows what's going to come up in here. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit today about why Google or why U of M went Google and how we planned our move. Uh, a few years ago, U of M conducted an internal study of IT on campus, and one of the more surprising things we found was that we had over 40 email and calendaring systems on campus, few of which actually talked to each other. Uh, we also had an aging IMAP system that was due for capital replacement. Leadership saw that opportunity. As it took this opportunity to provide a platform to campus that was a single collaborative environment. And this was done as part of our uh, Next Gen Michigan program. Uh, the goal of Next Gen is, as you can see, providing a campus IT environment which dramatically advances the university's academic, teaching, research, and clinical programs. And Google, uh, specifically Google Apps, Mail, and Calendar, certainly fit that bill as we moved into some cloud, more cloud services. Uh, and I'm just going to turn it over now, right now, to Martin. And we're going to talk about some of the planning and the actual execution of the migration. Um, so uh, as, many in, as many institutions that move to Google uh, might, might be experiencing, their current email systems uh, may be at capacity or overloaded. Uh, and so we were taking a look at our, our largest uh, email system on campus. That's our central IMAP service. Uh, and we realized that we couldn't migrate everyone all at once. Um, uh, it literally was running at 100% disk I/O for you know 23 hours a day. Um, so we broke we broke up the our population on campus into uh, sort of two large categories. Um, one which was students, uh, alumni, and sponsored sponsored affiliates, people that come into the university for a short period of time. Um, and one of the strongest pieces of feedback that we gathered from students is that they wanted to be able to migrate at any time. They didn't want to go with a big planned migration because it may not uh, it may not be like work with their schedule. Um, so one of the strong pieces of feedback that we we had there was that they the students really wanted to be able to choose when they migrate and they migrate on their own time. Uh, the the second group was the phase migrations, which was uh, faculty and staff, uh, basically, we divided campus up into um, four uh, different uh, groups or, or phases uh, and, and aligned those together so that uh, units that work closely with each other um, uh, were going to migrate at the same time. Uh, so we decided to go um, uh, over the summer because it's less disruptive to faculty than during the academic year. Uh, but one of the complications about that is that there's fewer faculty on campus. So, for example, if someone has problems with their migration or that kind of thing, they may be in Poland or Zimbabwe or Nigeria or somewhere uh, off campus. Uh, so 
um, we had a lot of considerations around that in terms of uh, you know making sure that people were able to work straight from day one. Um, the phased migrations uh, uh, were were about a month apart. Each each phased migration was was always about it was about a month apart, and we move uh, between three thousand and five thousand individuals in each phase migration. So, for example, um, we might bundle ten schools and colleges uh, that work closely together together to get to that five three to five thousand uh, individual mark. Uh, the other thing is that we we did the work over the weekends, so we we started Friday about midday uh, and started with doing stuff behind the scenes, um, and uh, the accounts were active by eight o'clock uh, Saturday morning. Uh, but for campus, that meant that uh, the go live was on a Monday. Um, one of the pieces of technology that allowed us to to do these sort of phased migrations is that we have a, a MX gateway, uh, mail routing gateway in front of uh, uh, Google application, uh, Google Apps right now. Uh, we've because so many there were so many systems on campus. We allowed people to met, route their mail anywhere. Uh, they could route it to a personal Gmail account, to a departmental server, uh, any place. And we utilized that system where we could choose the direction where people's mail was flowing to whatever endpoint to facilitate the phased migration approach. Um, uh, we did this by uh, uh, using our Canset, uh, campus uh, IDM system, that's our identity management system, uh, in, in two ways. Uh, we synced, uh, we synced uh, uh, user information over to Google about people's accounts, so their name, their password, their, their email address. And then we placed people into uh, various sub-organizations inside of Google uh, based on logic in our identity management uh, solution. So for example, um, if you were uh, provisioned in Google through our system, you were initially provisioned with uh, 38 of the uh, 40 applications. And we didn't have email and calendar turned on initially for people. So people could initially use uh, Docs, um, you know other other Google services, uh, and as they went live, we would take them out of that sub org um, in uh, inside of our Google Apps and put them in, in another uh, sub org, which uh, which had mail and calendar active. Um, and then one interesting piece of technology uh, that we uh, wrote into this is that uh, we had a number of individuals on campus that were very concerned about privacy. Uh, and so um, they were in, only interested in using the core applications that Google provided, things that are covered with our, uh, our, our agreement with Google. And so we allowed people to opt into only having uh, the, the eight or so core applications uh, on. Uh, and this alleviated much of the privacy concerns about going to a, a cloud-based solution. I will say that we only have about um, 300 people that have elected to use uh, this core, these core services only, um, out of 200,000. So it's a very small population, but we felt that we wanted to address their uh, their privacy concerns. Um, so we we initially uh, provisioned everyone into Google uh, for March 5th. Uh, uh, there's about 113,000 people. Um, this is we we provisioned everyone that was inside of our uh, uh, campus IDM that that met the criteria to to receive a Google account, um, and we provisioned them into the uh, restricted suborg, so no mail or calendar. Um, this this uh, mass provisioning took about five days. Um, Perio did help in in terms of getting this done faster than we would have otherwise. Uh, so it was really good, their experience that they brought to the table in terms of this sort of mass, uh, uh, mass um, provisioning. And we did work with, we also did work with uh, Google engineers uh, about this in terms of optimizing throughput, um, and that was very helpful uh, to, to have those resources to uh, 
speed the provisioning. It still took five days to get everyone in there, um, but uh, we couldn't have done it without Google or Imperial helping us out. Um, uh, David, do you want to take over for the uh, sure the tools? Absolutely. So uh, let me just make sure that my screen is showing up properly here. Yeah. So one of the um, you know kind of a um, the method and and set of tools that we that we started working with um, with Michigan um, was a was the out of the box Google tools themselves. So uh, many of you are probably familiar familiar with the GAMI tool, which is the Google Apps migration for Microsoft Exchange, which also is a server that handles migrations for the IMAP site as well. Um, the GAMI server itself is typically designed for a um, uh, IT administrator type use. It's not something that um, end users are, are typically, uh, it's not available normally to end users. Uh, and, it's, and it's generally run in kind of a, a mass setup. So it's a, it's a tool that's scalable uh, so that we can run, you know, multiple migrations at the same time. Um, I believe at the kind of the highest level of the managed migration piece, and we'll, we'll talk about the um, the self-migration piece in a moment. But for the managed migration piece, these are the, the migrations that um, the University of Michigan team and myself were running uh, during the, the lead up to the go lives. And kind of the process that the GAMI tool um, requires uh, to enable, to, to make sure that all of the users have their mail on the go live date, we actually do a pre-migration. Um, we were typically doing about seven to 10 days of pre-migration of mail um, before the go live date, uh, just the kind of the way that the GAMI servers work. I think at the at the maximum we were running around um, 20 to 25 GAMI servers. You guys can correct me on on that one uh, uh, for yeah, the managed were, migration pieces. We were we were running about 20 25 GAMI servers at once at the the, the maximum there. Yeah, and, and so yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just I just wanted to to talk a little bit about the, the migration assistant real quickly because it feeds into what you're talking about right now, um, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So um, the, the migration assistant is a, 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 essentially a web app which allowed people to select what data source um, they wanted. Uh, and so with 40 email, email and calendar systems on campus, people had multiple accounts all over the place. So they would have an exchange account, they would have an ITS IMAP account, they would have a departmental exchange account, they would have another calendar account somewhere else, and we weren't sure which one they would want in Google App Gaps. So what the migration assistant did was allow us to collect all this information up uh, and present it to the user in a sane fashion, saying, here is what we think you want to migrate to Google Apps in terms of mail and calendar, um, please please verify this and make a modify your selection if, if you want it. And we found that this, this tool uh, allowed us to get what users wanted to migrate because of the, the sheer multitude of systems out on campus uh, uh, correct. So that if users wanted two of their three accounts migrated, we were able to do that. If they wanted one account migrated, we were able to do that. If they wanted no mail migrated, we were able to do that. We took the output from that web application and fed it into uh, the, the GAMI servers that David and our team here at Michigan were running to conduct the migrations. So it's a, it's, it was an important piece in terms of allowing users to select what they wanted to migrate from, uh, from Michigan. Yeah, and and I, and I just like to, to point out that this is a pretty pretty unique um, path that Michigan took. Um, so I've I've worked with a number of other uh, university migrations. Um, one thing that we we find um, again that's a little bit different is that there was a lot of user choice uh, at University of Michigan, and so it was it was really um, it was fun to come up with the ways to to not only use the kind of the canned uh, Google provided tools. But also to integrate the migration assistant um, with some custom development uh, on the Perio side as well. And as a as a kind of the, the next step after that migration assistant that Martin just spoke of. Um, so one, once we were able to to gather the information from the migration assistant, um, 
again, the output of that was the lists of the items that uh, that the managed migration people uh, that, that we would use for the managed migration. But there was also a section of a self-migration tool uh, which the students had access to, which, which had a similar front end. In other words, uh, it, it requested uh, from them what they actually wanted to migrate. But what was different about the self-migration assistant tool was that the output of that was fed automatically into uh, the, our Aperio custom, uh, what we call the command and control tool. Um, so the University of Michigan, again, they developed the, the front end and the logic process um, for the, for the self-migration assistant section that uh, provided the list of students that were uh, electing to migrate at a particular time. So we actually had a number of these uh, command and control servers uh, set up. Um, and I think in a, in a moment, we'll, we'll actually flip back over to a, a live view on the Michigan side, because they're actually still running right now. Um, and in fact, yesterday when we were setting up, I, I, I asked uh, the Michigan guys if, if there was anybody still migrating. So we'll, we'll see. Maybe we'll get lucky and see, uh, see some people migrating at this time. Maybe uh, Martin and Ryan put some uh, bogus accounts out there with, uh, you know, no? Okay, no need. shaking the head. Yeah, no need to, right. So what, what it enabled them to do is the students, again, they were able to control their own migration uh, destiny there. So basically what the command and control tool did was it took that output file, and depending on what type of migration needed to take place, it would feed it through the, uh, the GAMI server itself. We actually wrote a, a wrapper tool that, that went around the GAMI server and essentially started and stopped the GAMI migrations uh, through the GAMI com, uh, command line. Um, the other method for migrating their contacts was through our custom Aperio power tools, which is a suite of power uh, suite of tools that we've written that goes uh, works against the the Google APIs. Um, in this case, we were using the the contact uh, API for that. At the end of the day, uh, at the end of their migration run, um, not only would they have all of their mail and contacts if they elected to do that, um, but they are. You know, the, the gateway was switched um, back on the migration assistance side. Um, and I think I, that actually happened at the very beginning of the process. So uh, as soon as a student elected to, to uh, be migrated to Google Apps, their, their delivery was changed immediately. So they were um, right off the bat, uh, their mail was being delivered to their Google Apps uh, UMish uh, EDU account. Um, anyways, at the end of the migration, they would also receive a report um, a custom Aperio developed report that we actually used our Cloud Spokes community, which is a, um, a developer community that Aperio manages to um, essentially uh, do quick iterations of, of batches of code. And we actually we used them to create the, the migration reporter piece that um, was fed then back to the user. I don't have a line all the way back to the, to the user side. Um, but that was kind of the, the process for that. Um, do you guys want to flip over to the RDP session? We'll yeah, see if there's yeah. uh, so, something to see. So um, just, to, just to go over the process again, um, what, what we would do is we would, um, uh, the user would go into the migration assistant. They would select what data they wanted to migrate. And this is, this is a student eligible for self-service migration. They would select a, um, a, what data they wanted to migrate. Their inbound MX record or their inbound mail forwarding address would be changed over to their Google account uh, immediately, and then their mail would populate over the next couple of hours, depending on how large the mailbox they had. Um, and then once that was done, the uh, the, the Perio tools would upload their uh, their their log data to the the migration reporter tool. And they would be able to see a report of what mail successfully migrated and what mail uh, had a problem for whatever reason. Generally, uh, we had like 99.99% mail migration if someone had a virus or something, large mail, spam, something in their, their mail. Uh, so what we're looking here is our is our active uh, is an active migration here, um, and uh, this is the invoker. Uh, the invoker wrapper tool that uh, Aperio wrote for us. Um, uh, and it, what it does is it, it, it goes out and queries when there's someone able to, to migrate, and it pulls down that information and then kicks off a command line version of GAMI. Um, 
Gammy, as you can see right here in the background, this this individual is migrating right now, um, and it'll process the, the, the individual. When it's done, it reports back that the person is done. And then we are also using uh, a, a shim that does uh, authentication uh, to our IMAP cluster. So we don't need someone's password in order to migrate their mail. We have administrator accounts that this shim uses to in order to uh, uh, migrate uh, the mailbox. Um, I'm going to click over to another server here where you can see where it's um, it's uh, waiting to uh, pick up a uh, an account to migrate. It's not actually uh, migrating right now, uh, and we can we can stop the tool, um, and then uh, uh, it'll it'll stop in a minute or so, um, and then we can you know update the box or uh, do what we need to do in terms of server maintenance there. Um, uh, so, David, back to you. Yeah, you. sure. Yeah, I, I just um, that's that was um, that was actually a really important piece to um, you know managing the other you know hundred however many thousands of people. So we actually managed the managed migration piece was around uh, like he had on the on the slide around three to five thousand uh, users. Over um, five, five or six or so migration periods, um, but the subsequent migrations, we we essentially just had to make sure that those boxes stayed up and running, and you know it allowed it took all of the student migration out of our hair. We did not have to do, you know, really worry about you know oh we're going to migrate students A through B A through C today or you know we did not do. And in fact, this is uh, just one last point about this is that. Um, you know, typically an Imperial migration, we would recommend a Big Bang migration. In other words, we would set kind of a date, um, you know, six months into the future, where we would we would attempt to migrate um, every single user um, and and turn them all on at the same time. Uh, but what we found quickly with with Michigan is that that didn't fit pretty much any of the the cultural aspects of of working with with University of Michigan. Um, some of the things like user choice, user decisions. Um, you know, they they weren't. Uh, that wasn't something that we were going to be able to change. So it was really important to kind of mold um, mold the methods that we normally used on on the migration tools, both canned and the ones that we created, to make sure that we could still um, you know culturally keep up with the way that Michigan needed to do their migration. Uh, that was uh, that was going to be a um, you know it was definitely something that that had to uh, align between Michigan and Imperio. Um, and just just to give you a sense of scale of the the number we're, numbers of people involved in this self migration versus the phase migration, the phase migrations once again there were four with between thir three thousand and five thousand uh, accounts being migrated. A lot of those accounts were administrative staff or faculty that had access to our on premise exchange installation. So we also migrated calendar data with them. Uh, the students pretty much exclusively had. Uh, What's known as our ITS IMAP service, um, and we had close to sixty thousand individuals uh, eligible to self-migrate. So this is the, the this self-migration process has been running essentially since March, allowing people to um, to migrate off of the old system onto the new system. Um, it's kind of interesting. Our initial com communication that went out, we had a huge number of people that that initially elected to self-migrate right away. Um, but then after that, we, we, didn't, uh, we didn't advertise all that much. Um, uh, but it was interesting to see the sort of networking effect of, of uh, the, or the, it virally spread on campus to see how many, you know, there are hundreds of people migrating each day. Um, and it, it, did, it didn't keep Barton up at night unless the servers were, uh, were mis misbehaving, so. Yeah. They could be migrating while we were asleep and not needing to manage that migration. So um, we can we can screen share uh, real quickly um, just our our uh, application our sort of little queue, uh, which you can see that right now we've got uh, forty some thousand people that are done, um, ten people that are migrating right now, two people whose contacts have already worked on. But we've we've almost migrated we've migrated over 36 terabytes of, of data through this tool with all over five six hundred thousand contacts, uh, which is 
is quite nice. We still have um, 10,000 people to go, but that's those are mostly accounts which uh, people aren't actively uh, checking or they're ignoring us. Uh, but we'll, we'll we have a, a phase where we have a plan to cut those over at, at the end, and there'll be a lot. They'll they'll have an opportunity to migrate later on. Um, uh, one other thing right here is that I'm, this is the migration assistant uh, splash page here. This is the page you would um, see if you were coming in to select what you're you're migrating. And as you can see, the ITS IMAP mail was the uh, mailbox that Ryan had selected. Um, the other nice thing about this is that this was a, uh, a, a nice reminder for individuals to go through and have a checkpoint where they say, we say, if you contain sensitive and regulated data, please, you know, please remember that this data should not be uh, pushed up to Google Mail. Um, so it was another opportunity for us to double check that no patient information or other sensitive data ended up uh, where it shouldn't be. Yeah, I want to I want to name check uh, Chris Steinhoff right now also as the uh, you know he's not on the call but he was uh, you know really really somebody who is a, an example of, of you know being able to work with a university person um, you know it, it really worked out um, he was able to we used an agile process of of collaborative development um, it's a lot of acronyms but. You know, it was it was something where where we were really able to um, to dial in what Michigan needed. Um, you know, at the same time, he had this this great front end, and I, I'm sure there was other people working on it as well. But um, you know, it was it it, it was nice working uh, in that environment. Chris Chris is one of our senior uh, support folks here on campus. Yeah, it's it was uh, one other nice part about this is that we were able to offload uh, some of the development work to Aperio here. Um, so that Chris wasn't, um, you know, developing uh, applications with with Gammy, but we could we could work with Aperio so that we the stuff that we wanted to do in house we could do in house because we had expertise. Something that fell a little bit out of our uh, expertise or we didn't have bandwidth for, we were able to offload to Aperio to accomplish that. Is it back to me? Back to you, Ryan. All right, back to you. Um, so, I'll get oriented here. Sorry. So, uh, a large portion of our efforts also uh, were around change management here on campus, helping campus become functional, if not proficient, with the new tools that we were giving them. Uh, this effort involved a large coordinated effort around communications especially as well as training events. Um, we conducted hundreds of pre and post migration events. We developed uh, a support site built on top of Google Sites that was our main communication vehicle besides email with campus. Uh, we recruited hundreds of Google Guides, both students and staff, to supplement the project team uh, to support folks the week of Go Live, you know, just getting their mobile devices set up answering questions, that type of thing. Uh, we had a VIP support program, which provided one-on-one -on -one support if the, the VIP and their, assist, their admin assistant staff desired it. Um, we also implemented a transition desk. This was, in addition to our standard service desk, or what is traditionally a help desk at most institutions, we had a secondary desk called the transition desk. And they were purposefully there to answer only questions about the Google transition. Uh, they answered. 18,000 questions? Was that the last statistic? I think it was, it was around 18,000. Over the course of the summer. So between March and basically September, around 18,000 calls just to that desk were handled by that group. Uh, the nice thing with that was because they were focused, they were building knowledge very quickly. Uh, they were geographically located together, so they were all in a common area, so they could quickly shout over the walls if they wanted to and answer each other's questions. Um, they also then transitioned that knowledge to the standard help desk, which really helped speed up the adoption of support there. Um, for our communications, we had a cadence for each go live. Uh, all of the things were all of the cadence points were based on the go live date. Uh, at eight weeks before the go live date, we would begin communications with the units. Uh, we had what we called unit readiness coordinators and unit technical leads. 
they were point people for, uh, for the project staff to communicate to the unit. So we didn't have to talk to every IT person within a unit or deal with a majority of the users just because we didn't have the bandwidth to do that. Uh, at five weeks before Go Live, we began communicating directly with the users. Uh, we used a list that was validated by those unit readiness coordinators and technical leads, so we were talking to the people that were actually migrating. Uh, we then put a welcome message into the inbox of anybody who migrated, so hopefully one of the first messages they saw when they logged into their Google Mail account was, a set of instructions and a welcome message of how a link to a day one guide on how to configure possibly some extensions, how to enable keyboard shortcuts, that type of thing. Oops. Uh, as I mentioned, we built a support site. It's uh, google.umich.edu. Uh, if you're interested in going out there, it will be live. We're going to be transitioning the site now. Uh, more away from the migration activities and more towards standard support and education. But uh, a lot of our old content is still out there in an archive. Um, we did archive all of the communications that went out as part of the comm cadence. So you can see some of those things. If you have any interest in them, please contact us. There's contact links all over the site. Um, yeah, we actually, oh, I, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I thought you were, <laughs> I, I just uh, wanted to jump in with it with a quick, a quick comment about you know, from the Perio side when working with University of Michigan, one thing that, I mean, among, among, you know, the list of everything that they did right, one thing that I'd like to focus on is really this, uh, you know, everything that, that Ryan just spoke of. Um, the, you know, using the Google Guides, uh, really building up a, an excitement and a sense of community around using Google. Um, you know, it, it's really easy just to say, oh, we're going to replace mail. And, you know, people, especially if they're used to a, maybe a, an older email system and they're, they're forwarding off their mail to Gmail already and they have been for years and they don't even care about it, they were able to, to make a buzz just kind of tying in what they said before is people are actually using the actual, uh, the Gmail, uh, instance for Google Apps for Education at UMich, which really, you know, it's really important from, um, you know, from, from the, from really everybody's standpoint. You know, the IT people can, can uh, see correct statistics, uh, they can manage the domain better, um, you know, all of those things that, that IT is called upon to do, they can do with their job now because the people are actually using the system. Um, but the thing that, uh, just a, the final comment is that they weren't selling just an email replacement. They were selling a, you know, a, a sea change of communication um, that goes along with their, their next, you know, all the other next gen um, objectives that are, are continuing to roll out. It, um, and from what I understand, it's, it's, it's just, this is just one piece of, of that uh, long-term collaborative goal um, to, you know, to, to, bring, to bring these systems into the future. And that was one of the key messages we had over the summer was, <clears throat> excuse me, while a lot of the training was about how to become proficient in the use of mail and calendar and a little bit more on, the, a little bit of docs training in there as well, um, the message was we're focusing on this now because this is the data we're migrating, but we are giving people access to a platform. And we want campus to adopt Google Apps not as just your mail client, but as that your account, you're getting an at UMich identity within our domain and that gives you access to dozens and dozens of apps and we want to see people build things on top of those apps. And that is clearly the direction we'll be moving in this coming calendar year. Uh, we want to educate campus on how to use those kinds of things. Uh, our change management efforts are certainly not over. But uh, that was one of our core messages was it's not just mail, it's not just calendar, it's a whole lot of other things. Um, just, uh, oops, apologize. I'm not proficient with my own tool. <laughs> um, just quickly wrapping up the support and training uh, section here. So we did information sessions two weeks prior to a go live. Generally, we did two to four sessions per unit. Uh, this was really kind of a preview. We showed them the tools for people who've never seen Google Mail or Calendar. Uh, we answered a lot of questions and a lot of concerns about you know, why we're doing this, how is it going to look, what does the week look like. Um, and then the week of Go Live, we had what we call drop-in sessions, and these were sessions where we would be physically in the building. Uh, typically, we had uh, staff people from the unit there along with student Google Guides 
uh, and if available, we would have project staff representing. Um, one thing, uh, did you bring yours? Oh, yeah. We, uh, we had shirts made up for everybody who was in the guide program. Uh, nice, bright yellow. <laughs> Should have queued him for this. So uh, let's make sure everybody can see it. So you could see somebody from afar with their bright yellow sleeves and the M plus Google logo walking around campus. <laughs> um, we gave everybody the opportunity when they entered training that you were going to become a target for questions, and that was their sole purpose of wearing the shirt. Uh, but it was a really successful program. We had hundreds. Of, we recruited hundreds of students. We had probably just as many staff that were recruited and went through training, and they were our front line for questions generally. Um, the project staff certainly couldn't have handled it on our on our own. Uh, I would highly recommend the guide program. Um, Purio can certainly help you with that. Um, one thing I I would really like to stress is that uh, this this may seem like a lot of work or a lot of effort went into this, but Really, it's about making sure that campus is productive on day one, uh, and, and that they're excited to use the tools, and that they they can move forward with their their research and their you know, their studies and that, that kind of stuff. The things that are really uh, important here, you know, uh, at U of M, to make sure that we're uh, we're here to support the mission of the university, and that you know that was our goal for day one to make this transition as smooth as possible. Uh, and as far as the guide program goes, the one thing I think we took away from that is if you are working with students at an educational institute, you probably want to be recruiting probably about double what you actually need. Um, students' schedules are a bit more flexible than staff's schedules tend to be, and uh, you, you will have to have somebody stay on top of scheduling and making sure that people are actually checking into their locations. As far as the presentation goes, that's all we had. I think we have plenty of time for questions and answers, so I'm going to see if Jordan has collected any of those while we've been shuffling back and forth. Thanks for uh, all that content there. That was really helpful. And I love that uh, Umish Google yellow shirt there. I think that's a great idea. Um, as we hear more questions come in, I'll, I'll be happy to share some of my thoughts on the activities that you all did. In general, I think our team has been very impressed with your rollout, and uh, I think a lot of schools will, will really learn um, some helpful tips and tricks and best practices. Um, and even for those that have already deployed Google Apps, I think there's still always opportunities to re-engage the community, um, maybe at the beginning of back to school or um, at the start of a new semester or around another planned um, themed conference or activity or day. Um, I think there's always opportunities to uh, get the word out and, and help let the community know that um, Google Apps or any solution you provide uh, is part of the larger mission. So we have quite a few questions from um, soon-to-be Apps customer CU Boulder. So uh, Corey, thanks so much for all the questions. Um, so the first question, uh, they'd love to hear more about your support experience for users with conflicting accounts. Um, were there a lot of them and did they struggle? Um. Yes, we had a lot of conflicting accounts, and many of those folks unfortunately struggled. Um, I will so before I go into an answer, I will plug our website one more time: uh, google.umich.edu. We have a very large page on conflicting accounts, how they occur, how you reconcile them. Um, but that said, we had um, well, without going too far into the weeds on this, we had about five thousand people who were. They were going to be conflicted no matter what. Uh, they had the Team Edition accounts, for those of you who remember Team Edition. Uh, typically what happened was they would log in. Uh, generally it happened about, what, October, November of last year when we claimed our domain. People immediately started getting the conflicting account messages and started calling our service center about what to do. Um, I think four of the people on the project team actually had it, so we had the opportunity to document it pretty well, but to be quite honest, it, you have to walk through the wizard to to do it. Uh, the easiest path tended to be having them either associate it with a non-Google mail account, so me.com or whatever you happen to have, or just creating a new Gmail account and copying the data over to that account. Um, unfortunately, uh, with the portability of some of that data, especially YouTube content, tended to trip up people a lot. Um, there really isn't a good path to move that data into the domain. 
Uh, there's two points I'd like to bring up. One is this is an issue where you really need to get the local IT staff involved, and they're, they're likely to have the conflicting accounts. So if you can get them in a forum or talk about it in a forum with them and say, once you get through this initial login, it's not a huge deal, um, it, they can, they'll be able to get their staff or their, their individuals through it. Um, the second thing, which um, ruined a presentation of mine but was a really good move by Google, um, was that you can't create accounts without an at Gmail address anymore. So, for example, uh, before you could sign up for a conflicting account with an at Umich address. And so the buzz leading up to uh, the deployment of Google Apps actually created a lot more conflicting accounts here at UVM. But you won't have that same problem anymore because you can't do the same thing with conflicting accounts anymore. So hopefully you'll have uh, less than us. <laughs> but it really engaged those local um, local support people um, uh, and, and walk them through the process, show them a video. Uh, they're the ones that, uh, because of the complexity of the issue, will be able to resolve the issue for the individuals as quickly as possible. Thanks for the tips on conflicting accounts. Uh, they, they can be confusing. But we do have a nice Help Center article, which I'll post on the Google and Education page, uh, that visually explains what they are. I think that's probably the tough step, is just explaining to people what they are. Because a lot of people, at least what I heard from our customers, they didn't even know they had conflict accounts. They didn't know they created a consumer or personal Google account with their uh, school address before. And so just explaining to them what that is. Um, visually, I think helps. Uh, so we have a nice little video that helps explain that, and I think that will help too. Um, and then let's uh, check out another question uh, in the meantime. Uh, additionally, what e-discovery policies and solutions did you choose for email and Google Drive? Uh, we use uh, 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 GAM. It's a, it's a Google Apps Manager. It's an open source tool. Uh, to snapshot and audit uh, user accounts. Uh, this is something that we're going to be looking forward now that we are through most of the migration activities. We're going to be taking another uh, uh, quick look at in terms of figuring out what other tools are out there uh, in the marketplace. Uh, I would highly suggest joining the North American uh, app user list. There's a lot of uh, messages that come through there uh, from other schools that have experience using the various tools that are out there. Um, and they have various recommendations. There's tons of them out there. But that, that list will really be able to tell you where to, where to start your search. Uh, but the, the tool that we use right now is called Google Apps Manager. It's search for GAM and G-A-M and Google, and uh, it's the first hit. GAM. Yeah, I keep hearing of more and more customers using that tool, so I'll make sure to post that on the Google Plus page, too. Um, any other questions out there in the community, please submit them on the uh, comment section of uh, the Hangout announcement we have. And actually, I have a question in the meantime. So uh, what would you say, I mean, there are a lot of activities and parts in your rollout, but what would you say had the most impact on having a successful rollout? people really adopting the tools and, and using it, um, what would you say was, was the, was the uh, activity that, that led to that? That's a good question. Um, an activity that drove adoption? Uh, to, to be honest, I think, and maybe this might be a cultural thing here on campus, but we're so spread out and we're so, uh, the, there's a, <laughs> phrase are going on, we're a loose confederation of 26 schools and colleges lumped under a university. Um, yeah. It's it's hard to personalize something when you're central IT. So being in front of people, putting a face on the transition, you know, it it's it's easy for, you know, we're, we're, we're going through our own transitions here as consumers of products that it's easy to lose sight of the goals of why something is happening mm. because you're affected so much by the actual activity that when you go and talk to some people or to some someone individually or to a group of people and answer their questions, show that you understand that this is it's a hard transition, it's a big change, and you're not alone. We're trying to address that stuff. 
Um, here's where you can go find out information. Here's my email address. Here's my cell phone number. Whatever it takes to you know, either put somebody at ease or give them a support outlet, it really helps build confidence in the transition that you have that's going to happen. And it gets them over that initial, you know, Monday morning for every phase, 5,000 people walked in and their email inbox was completely different. You know, it, most of these folks were using Exchange on Outlook or IMAP over Thunderbird or Apple Mail. <coughs> Everything looked worlds different than they they had on Friday. And just knowing that there's someone there that can help them with that probably helped them. Yeah, I think, I think from my perspective, getting in front of campus and having forums um, and, you know... Building a community. Yeah, getting them excited and letting them know that it's not some terrible monster that's making them move to Google, that it's actually people like us, um, uh, you know, I think really had them, uh, had campus transform how they think about it and... Uh, um, uh, they weren't so they weren't afraid they were excited and you know you show them labs you show them that kind of thing and then they can customize the browser and then they're off and running you never hear from them again so. hmm. another question uh, is there any planning at Michigan with Google Apps for the digital public library of America due to be accessible in April 2013 um. I have not heard that term, so I'm going to go with no. <laughs> uh, digital Public Library. I'm not familiar with that, to be honest. Uh, so, no, we don't have any plans. Or that being said, um, we are a loose confederation of schools. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone in our library system could be uh, very well involved in that. Yeah, that, that's very true. We'll, we'll take, we'll take we'll, that back. Yeah, I, I'm making notes here, and I will, if, I will follow up with you, Jordan, if we do have something on campus and we can connect people if they need to talk. Sure. Uh, a couple more from CU Boulder. Mm -hmm. uh, would you describe in more detail how Google Guides were identified and what their role was? So for staff Google Guides, oops, sorry, uh, for staff Google Guides, it was uh, kind of up to the units. <laughs> uh, for most units, uh, and sorry, units, schools, colleges, it's kind of all interchangeable terms here. Uh, in general, they would volunteer to their manager, and their manager would evaluate what kind of capacity they had, uh, and then those names would be compiled by the unit's unit readiness coordinator and submitted to us as a, on the project team. Uh, for students, we actually had a recruitment event here on campus, um, gay in Google's offices. <laughs> Ann Arbor has a Google sales office, so we got to use that. Uh, we had a lot of students come by, and we signed them up. Uh, we have a workforce management tool that we use to schedule them so they could self-select the slots they wanted to cover and they were essentially student temp workers so they were paid I don't remember what the rate was but they had an hourly rate for however many sessions they covered so they were motivated to cover more um, versus less if their schedule allowed. Um, uh, and then and did sorry for that to, just a quick button on that one uh, all the guides who were identified to us went through a training session um, you didn't get a shirt unless you actually completed training, so we did have uh, kind of a gate at that point as well. And did you all uh, leverage your student ambassadors too? We did. We had two student, uh, student well, we went through four because they transitioned in the middle yeah. of our project. <laughs> but yeah, we did use our student ambassadors. Uh, they were, I think they presented at our recruiting event, and they were certainly out on campus uh, as guides and being ambassadors for all of the apps to especially the student population, but I think they interacted with some staff and faculty as well. Great. Uh, and just for others out there not familiar with student ambassadors, so it's a program we have at Google. If you do a search for Google Student Ambassadors, we have a site and more information on the program. But essentially, there are college students that are liaisons between their campus and Google. Oftentimes, they're interns in a variety of departments here at Google, and they're pretty knowledgeable about our products. And when they go back to school, uh, there is there is a free resource for you to work with on uh, promoting uh, technology on your campus. So I know CU Boulder, you you do have an ambassador, um, and it sounds like uh, along the lines of what Michigan was able to do, you could definitely leverage them for your rollout. Uh, another question from them: um, Did you also offer any extended hours with your support desk? Yes, we did. Um, we. Well, so our service desk in general extended their hours in the course of our project. It wasn't caused by our project, but they kind of did it as a more 
they were offering better service to campus in general. Uh, the transition desk, however, we had extended hours. I think we started at 7 in the morning and went till uh, 7 most nights. The week of go live for those, we had weekend support, so we had people on the phones on the weekends, and I think it, support was extended until 9 p.m. for just that week. But yeah, we definitely had extended support hours for that. Um, and I will say for our VIP support program, anybody who was identified as a VIP during a phase was given contact information for an individual. Uh, generally, it was one of the project team members, although we did leverage some of the senior support staff as well. But they were given uh, an email address, a cell phone number, and latitude to call or contact that person at any time throughout the weekend. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody actually calling one of their people. But handing your your dean or an associate vice president someone's cell number and saying it's mine, you can call me on Sunday morning at three in the morning if you want to, alleviated a lot of concerns. Mm. I believe the the VIP packet really helped with that as well because they had a they had two was it two sheets one or two yeah, sheets some small one account. or two sheets where they could quickly figure out how to access their email their calendar um, set up their phone set up their phone that's mm. very big but uh, those. Uh, that alleviated man, many of the, the concerns um, that they had. Um, as far as support, I'll just kind of riff on this for a minute too. Um, I think probably our number one, if not close to our number one support call was, how do I set up my iPhone um, or my Android phone or whatever it happens to be. Um, having a good set of instructions for whatever your institution has settled on as far as policy or configuration knowing the pitfalls of which phones don't set up well, which phones might not, which phones might need special apps in order to take care, advantage of the services. Making sure everybody knows that, you're going to get a ton of support calls about it. Just be ready to handle it. Hmm. Um, another quick question that came in. Have you all enabled Google Plus or any other consumer apps? Yes, we have. We, so, go ahead. Um, <laughs> so our, uh, our approach to apps in the domain has been, unless there's a compelling reason not to, we're turning it on. Um, things we haven't turned on are like the YouTube ads. Um, we currently have Wallet off, although we're talking about turning that on. Um, I'm trying to think what else is off. Uh, the, like, Anything uh, that generates revenue, essentially. Ad-based ad off. Yeah. Um, one thing to note is that, uh, so we, we have, as uh, lots of lots of those applications on, uh, but there there are uh, if you're affiliated with the medical system, um, the two applications that you do not get are mail and calendar because they have they have their own mail and calendar system, um, and then we do have an option for individuals who don't want to use any of the consumer accounts to opt out of that. And like I said, it's a very small population, so I'm not sure if other schools want to invest the time into sorting the, that out, but. Uh, we found it very, uh, very useful for uh, dealing with that small population. Yeah, the, the core suborganization is worth the effort if you can, you can spare the effort. Mm. Uh, back to the support question. Uh, for, for those answering the phones during the extended hours, was it primarily students or professional staff? Professional staff. All for, we had no students on the phones. Okay, no students on phones. Okay. Um, and to kind of add an addendum to did we turn on Google Plus. Um, not only did we turn it on, we utilized Google Plus heavily as a project to deploy the apps. We would not have been as successful or as, well, I won't say stress-free, but the stress levels would have been incredibly compounded if we had not had Google Plus, specifically Hangouts. It allowed people to, from wherever they happen to be, a lot of the time they were at home, they could roll into the Hangout do their activity and roll out. We had a large cross-organizational involvement in the actual migration of data and accounts. Google Plus was a key component of that work. Yeah, we, we might have had eight or ten people on the Hangout on the go-live night. Um, you know, David would come in, for example, uh, he came in a couple times earlier in the year, but he was, he was at his home. Uh, I was at my home. Brian was at his home when we were doing the actual migration activities. And in fact, our executive director thought we were all coming into the office for the first two or three phases. <laughs> yeah, I, if I might just add a little bit more to that, is that you know one thing that, that we find um, through our you know through not only the University of Michigan um, 
rollout, but pretty much any rollout that, that we do is that, that very first step of, of getting the core IT team involved immediately in the tool set and taking them deep. I mean, you know, starting the Hangouts right away, whatever is available, we're, you know, we're like, you guys need a, a, a Google account right now because I'm going to start sharing stuff with you. I'm not going to send you any attachments. And we're a little bit, you know, okay, we, I can be a little bit flexible about that if I need to, but, you know, Michigan was, was really flexible and, and excited to um, get that core team um, spun up and running, and, and especially, you know, taking that over to the communications people and getting them comfortable with it as they begin to broadcast the changes out, they're intimately familiar with, with the, the new system as well. Yeah, our, our project manager, Don Brennan, called that eating our own cake. Yeah. Mm. At Google, we call it eating our own dog food. <laughs> yeah, we, we tried to convert her to that, but it didn't work. Yeah, no, cake has a nice connota nicer connotation. As someone who's rolled out, uh, you know, has maintained infrastructure for 10 years, and we've done, you know, monthly patching and, you know, application patching and that kind of thing, you know, we had other tools that you could use to, to do and coordinate those kind of efforts, but Google Plus is really um, the way to go in terms of coordinating, sharing documents, checking off things. It, it's. I wish I would have had it ten years ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even in the in the actual go live evenings, we were working off the same checklist. So you know, at any given time, we didn't have to break out to give the the to give Dawn a report of what's going on. She she could pop in and dial in and look at look at our list, and we were keeping that updated. They could see what was on and off. Um, you know, and all the, all the communication and sub communication and the background communication was just. Uh, critical. Yeah. Right. Well, I think we're uh, about to run out of time. Last call for any questions, uh, submit them on the page there. Um, but I guess uh, I'll hand it back to you all to leave with any uh, final thoughts or recommendations or reflections on uh, rolling out Google Apps. If you've, if you've been assigned to the project to roll out Google Apps at your campus, I hope you're uh, fortunate enough to be working with such a great team uh, that we had here. Um, it's, it was a lot of fun. It, if you know, you're using new technology, it's great. Um, I, don't know, I had a lot of fun on this project. I, as did I. Um, I will say probably one of the things we glossed over because we didn't have, we only had an hour and we could talk for a week about this. Mm. Um, you're going to do a lot of planning up front. You're going to set a lot of schedules. You need to be really flexible with that. As you do pilots, we would really encourage you to do uh, small and full-scale pilots. You're going to discover a lot of things about your institution that you didn't realize going in. So just be ready to be reactive to some surprises within your own organization. Yeah, and I, I I just like to add the more to the to the planning part of that comment. You know, testing your systems, um, knowing what you know, being honest about what your backend systems are are behaving like. Because you know, I mean, to be frank, most uh, not most a lot of a lot of organizations. Um, Come to Google Apps, kind of at that at that that point where their their servers are about to fall over, or they're full, or they're coming to the uh, end of a license with a you know uh, a decision point is is to be made, and and often those times um, you know are are stressful and hectic to begin with, um, but you know planning and knowing knowing what the issues are going to be long before you're uh, you're up on Friday night because you still will have other issues on Friday night. Uh, while you're going with it, so if you've if you've knocked out 19 out of 20 bugs, um, you know you only have one to squash before you can go live. So, and then the only other thing I'd add is this is as much a cultural change as a technical change, and you need to be prepared to address that directly. To be honest with your campus about what's happening, why it's happening, mm. what to expect in the future, um, and just. Talk to talk to people. Call them. <laughs> go to their office. A handshake and a smile goes a long way. Great. Well, thanks again uh, to all of you for taking the time to share your experience with rolling out Google Apps and lots of recommendations and tips that I think everyone will benefit from. And uh, thank you to uh, our participants in asking lots of questions, particularly CU Boulder. Thank you for the questions. Um, this Hangout was recorded, so uh, if there are any of your colleagues out there that missed this Hangout, you can definitely send them the recording. Uh, we'll archive everything on our ED1 Air site. 
Uh, so with that, we're wrapping up, and uh, have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.